There we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Renee Marshall. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited to talk to you about the faculty interviewing process and tips that you can take to help you be successful in a community college interview when you're uh, interviewing for a faculty position. As I said, my name is Renee Marshall, and I have been working with our community colleges since 2004. Um, before I was working with community colleges, I was in our K through 12 system as, as a teacher and I've been trained as an administrator. And so um, I love education. Um, I actually really enjoy interviewing. I know that might sound kind of strange. Um, and one of the reasons I decided to um, create this workshop was the last time I interviewed for a position, um, somebody on my committee, on my interviewing committee, as I was leaving, as I had received the position, they pulled me aside and they said in their 15 years of interviewing that I was um, in the top like two or three strongest people that they've ever seen interviewed. And so she suggested that I started doing some workshops. So, um, so that's why I'm here today. I'm really excited to talk to everybody about the interviewing process. I have been very lucky in that I have interviewed for adjunct and full-time positions successfully within the community college system. I also had one experience um, at the very beginning where I interviewed for an adjunct position that was not a successful um, gain for me. So I think I'm coming with a really good perspective. Um, please know that in the chat box, I've got my contact information, I have my email, and I have my um, cell phone. You're welcome to contact me at any time, um, especially, especially if you are going out for a position and you want somebody to practice interviewing with. Um, it might sound kind of silly, but I totally enjoyed doing that. And so um, I just want to make sure that you know my contact information is in the chat. The chat is open for questions or comments at any time. I will make sure to leave a chunk of time at the end of our workshop so that way um, we can have a discussion because I know there will be questions. But thank you so much for everybody for being here. I greatly appreciate it. And let's go ahead and get into the workshop. So um, today we're going to be talking, as I mentioned, about tips and strategies for those interviewing within the community college system, specifically for faculty positions. Before we talk about those tips, though, I want to define part of who we are and what we do. And, and part of that is what, what is an adjunct position? Um, it's really important to know that an adjunct position is considered a supplementary rather than an essential part of the campus. Now, I just because, I shouldn't say essential part of the campus, that's not the right way to say it, because our adjuncts are absolutely essential. Our adjuncts in the community college system make up about 75% of our teaching workforce. So having a part-time or adjunct position is really important, but it's important to know that if you open up the dictionary, the word adjunct literally means at will. It means supplemental, it means extra. So while the adjunct positions take up about 75% of our workforce, please know that when you're an adjunct, you don't have the same type of rights that you have when you're a full-time faculty member. You're often given a limited contract. It may be one semester at a time. They may skip semesters for you, um, but you won't be like on a traditional tenure track uh, for a position. Now, I'm not saying that's a problem at all. It is incredibly, incredibly common within our community college system to be an adjunct or part-time faculty member for um, sometimes years before you get a full-time opportunity. Um, I had the opportunity of being an adjunct from 2004 until 2000, goodness, 2004 to 2012. So I served for a long time as an adjunct and I served in both education and early childhood education. Um, and even though both of those were under one department at my school, um, sometimes they're not. So anyways, um, it can be a really lucrative way to get into a college. Um, you can make a decent amount of money as an adjunct, but as you're striving for full-time positions, it's always good to know, always keep your eye on both types of positions and be willing to go out for both. Even if you are brand new and have never had a position yet, do not be fearf fearful to go out for a full-time faculty position. Okay, let's go ahead and we're gonna start talking about resume. Um, Oh, I just heard that somebody says they don't see my contact info. Let me cut and paste it one more time and put it in. There we go. Okay, so let's first start with our resumes, because the first thing, um, as somebody who has had the opportunity to hire quite a few people over the years, um, oh my gosh, resumes are so crucial. First off, if you are out of, if you're coming from out of state or you're coming from out of country and you're applying for a position, especially for an adjunct part-time position, Within your cover letter, you need to tell us why. Um, it's really hard as somebody who reads um, resumes and is looking for good staff to suddenly find somebody who is you know, sending in a resume from Minnesota 
Or I once had somebody send in a resume from China. And if for a full-time position, I can see doing a state move or, and or potentially an international move. I could totally see that. But when I'm hiring for adjunct or part-time positions, it can be kind of confusing. So, but if for instance, your whole family is planning to transfer to the area that you're trying to be employed in, it's a great time in your cover letter to share that with whoever is going to be reading your documentation. So if I get a, if I get a, uh, an adjunct position application for somebody from Washington, but then they tell me that in fall 2020, their family is planning to relocate to the town that I live in, then of course I'm gonna to wanna to really look thoroughly in that application and see if they're a good match for the position. Now, if that cover letter doesn't explain how they're planning to move to my area or what their intention is, um, it can be confusing. Now, I do know of, a, of somebody that we hired once that was a fantastic match. She lived out of the area and she let us know from the very beginning that she was interested in being an online faculty member and, do, and teaching online. So then if she was teaching remotely, it wasn't necessary for, uh, for her to be close to us proximity wise. So it was great though, because she let us know that from the beginning and she ended up getting hired. It's so essential to let your reader know why you want the position that you're applying for, especially if you're from somebody out of state. Now, before you're even getting ready to submit your resume and your documentation that goes to the college, before any of that, before you finalize, <laughs> um, honestly, before you really start, one of the most strategic things that you can do as somebody applying to the community college system is to check out the mission statement and or vision statement for the campus that you're applying to. You wanna make sure like that you've done your homework. You wanna make sure that your application is unique to the campus. I cannot even tell you how many times people send in generic, generic applications, generic cover letters, um, outdated letters of recommendation, outdated um, cover letters, um, outdated packets. And you just, and I, as somebody who reviews them, I think, why would I want to hire somebody who's not willing to update their materials for the position, you know? And so um, it's really important that your application matches the campus and the job and faculty position that you're applying for. Another strategy too, for those of you going for faculty, if you want to work on a certain campus, I would research their department now. I'd learn as much as you can about the classes, the courses, the certificates, the degrees, what type of extra things that department does. Because if you have an opportunity within your paperwork to mention something or to tie something in, um, you know, I'm a developmentalist. I, I'm, I come from early childhood education and the education field. So with, I might tie in something about the um, National Association for the Education of Young Children and how long I've been a member, something, something that's relevant if I know that their campus is um, accredited from that group, or you wanna make that connection. You wanna make sure that your application is unique. When a generic application comes, it sticks out like a sore thumb to everybody who's on the committee reviewing it. And so it's, it's, really, it's really not, strategic, honestly. Um, if you really want the position, you're gonna take the time to submit paperwork that's going to be top notch. Um, for anyone who struggles with paperwork, it's a great time to have somebody help you and to proofread and to check what you're doing. Uh, as someone who um, has reviewed quite a few different types of paperwork over the years for, for faculty trying to get positions, um, don't have typos. It sounds like the silliest, like easiest thing in the wor world. Um, you'd be shocked how many people have typos within what they submit. Uh, we had a kind of rule of thumb, the people I worked with, where if you had one typo, it was no problem, mistakes happen. But if somebody's gonna have two, three, five typos, why would I want you as faculty? Why would I want you as the model and the guide and the lead for our students? Um, not that we have to be perfect, but we have to be proficient and we have to be professional. So it's really essential that you're making sure your documentation is really in tip top shape. One kind of uh, a weird suggestion that I have, this is something I do personally that I found to be really effective. Um, a lot of times people will read their application left to right because that's the way we, we read. We read from the left side of a paper to a right side of a paper. But when we read left to right and you're reading your application, when you have mistakes on your paper, or on, on your form, 
you often, your brain will often self-correct them so you don't realize the mistake exists. So one of the things I do in order to help me check is I read from right to left. I read my application backwards. Now, it doesn't make sense because the words are out of order, obviously. Um, they're in reverse order. But that is exactly why I do it because instead of reading the documentation or the document, I then read word by word by word to look and make sure that I'm using the right words and that they're spelled properly. Um, it's a pain to do it. It's a pain, but it really makes a difference. Also with your cover letter too, think about how you're connected to the campus. Are you alumni? Did your mom go there or your dad go there or your sister? Did you grow up in the town, in the college town while you were younger? What is your connection to the college? Um, we want to know that, especially if you're alumni or you have a child who went to the school or is enrolled or um, we like to hire our own within the system. It's really important to elevate um, the people who have been in our classrooms. Um, so they're leading the, the classrooms. They've been students and now they're faculty. So if you have a connection to whatever college you're applying to, you wanna be explicit and let them know exactly what that is. Okay, one thing I wanna to share too about resumes, and honestly, this is more for K-12, but I know some of you may end up in a different education system. So I'm gonna say it, um, don't, put your picture on your resume. I have never understood that. Um, I feel like it's like with the next generation, some of the, the younger students have been taught that they should do that so they're easily more easy to identify or maybe to make the or the resume seem more personal or unique. Um, it's distracting. Uh, last time I had a picture on a resume, I spent so much time staring at it because the person looked so young that I kept thinking, is there any way that they really have finished all their requirements? Um, honestly, it was just really distracting to me. So while it's not common to include pictures within a community college application process, it does happen. And I would say avoid it. <laughs> uh, I hope you don't mind me being honest there. Now, what do I want to see? What do they want to see? First of all, um, in addition to are you connected to the campus and what you know about the campus, we want to see on your resume, have you done any nonprofit work? Do you do any work that's um, any volunteer work, especially related to whatever department or position you're applying for? Um, do you have any community awards? Are you somehow linked to the community? And please do not share your high school and junior high awards. Even if you are a younger faculty member who has gotten your master's in your early 20s and you're applying for a position, um, um, I re it, it just, it really makes you seem young and there's nothing wrong with being young, but um, you know, part of being a faculty member is, is um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's like the confidence and the, like the adultness of being a faculty member. And so I think it's important that you want to celebrate your nonprofit work. You want to celebrate anything you're doing in, the, in, your, in your community to volunteer or to make a difference, any types of awards you have, but I would stay away from the high school awards. Um, one of the things too that we want to know about is what type of partnerships do you have in the community? Um, especially if you're coming from an ed another education system or another campus where you already have established relationships and established partnerships. That can be a huge asset for a department um, if they already have somebody who has some relationships established. So you want to make sure that you share that. You, you really want to make sure that you share that as much as possible. Um, Okay, let me go on now a little bit. Actually, real quick, before we get into interviewing, are there any questions that anyone wants to ask about your actual um, paperwork that you submit for your, including your resume? Just real quick, real quick check. Okay, I will keep an eye on the chat box. So if at any point anyone does have a question related to it, please let me know. Okay, what if they ask about Facebook? Oh, great. Oh, I love that you just said that. Wonderful. It's imperative to have a professional ident identity and then it's okay to have a non-professional identity too. So for instance, if they ask um, like for you know, your, your LinkedIn handle or something like that, to me, that's my professional side. But if they ask for an Instagram, Facebook, something that is not uh, professional, but more of a personal, I would not include that. Um, also, please know, whatever you put online, people see. People have this false sense of security with different social media platforms as if um, they can post stuff and things will remain private. Employers check everything. 
we um, Google you. We want to find out what different social platforms you're looking at. We're checking to see how you represent yourself because you will be an arm of the college or an arm of the department. It, I mean, you really, if you work, if you get employed as a full-time faculty member, especially, it's not like an eight to five position. You're, you're that all the time. And it's tricky, but as a public educator, um, you know, the, the world kind of owns us in a strange way. And so because of that, um, there's some definite kind of rules about what you have to do. Um, Julio, I agree, no Vegas picks. Um, <laughs> he just put that on, on chat. I think that's great. Uh, it's okay to be human, but you also want to make sure that you represent yourself the best way possible. Now, one thing though, if you are somebody who's coming from another campus or another education system, and maybe you've created some sort of of support group for students on Facebook or on Instagram or something on YouTube or whatever. If it is related to students and to what you've done, I would absolutely include it with an explanation of what it is. Um, okay, great. I also just got a quick private chat asking, is it a problem if I don't have anything besides LinkedIn? Like if I don't have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, not at all. As long as you've got your LinkedIn profile, that's a great thing to have um, that's a great way for people to see professionally who you are and who you're connecting with so um, I don't think it's necessary to have those others at all um, if you're on a campus that asks you to at some point it would be related to your like department and your program that you're running most likely um, and even then you'd have some support on campus in terms of how do you get that up and running and how do you keep that maintaining so um, great questions thank you Okay, now I want to get into the interview and I'm going to be pretty specific on this. Now, when we're talking interview to everybody, if at any time anybody wants my notes or you want to like look over the webinar after, please know I'm, I'm an open book. The webinar will be available. We're taping it right now. In addition to that, I'm happy to share the notes that I'm speaking from today. So let me know if I can be more of an asset for you and help you more. So interviewing. Earlier I mentioned with your resume how important it was to look at the mission statement and the vision statement of the campus. Same thing now, you've made it through the paperwork process, you're now going into interviews. Uh, first thing to know, if you're going for an adjunct or part-time uh, part position, interviews may be um, scheduled as quickly as every 30 minutes, every 45 minutes, every hour. So even though it feels like, oh, I'm going for an interview and I wanna talk and tell them so much, the reality is you really are limited. Um, if you're going in with a 30 minute window and you've got 10 questions, you're looking at like two to three minutes per question. It's really, really minimal time. Um, but if you're going for a full-time position, you will have longer for your interview, but even then it's really, it's not as long as I wish they were honestly because it, they really have to get a snapshot quickly of who we are. But in addition to reviewing the mission statement and the vision statement for your resume, you want to do that for interviewing as well. You want to do it right before. Honestly, I'd keep a printed copy of it with me with, with all my other documentation I was bringing in. In addition to that, you want to be able to reference the department website or any sorts of programs and resources that the department you're applying for already has in place. If you can come into an interview and you already know the school and the culture and anything that lets us feel like you're an insider, it's we're way more likely to hire you because we want people who understand the school as much as possible and understand our department, our programs, and how we serve our students. So the more that you research ahead of time and can entwine in your interview, the better off you're going to be. Okay, a couple of just practical things about the interview. This is gonna, this, some of my suggestions might kind of sound kind of silly, but I'm just being honest about things that I've seen over the years. Um, be on time, be early. If you are going to a campus you are not familiar with, do not wait until your interview to go there. If by any means you can go earlier, please do. Um, I once had somebody who came in for an interview and she, I, I, at that time I was on a campus that was, it was kind of confusing, especially where they booked the interviews. It was not an easy place to find. And she came in late. She came in flustered. She was out of breath. She was like, you know, sweaty and oh, it's just, you know, it was just a, it was a really uncomfortable situation for everybody. And we had somebody else who was going to be interviewed right after her. So it wasn't like we had this huge amount of time that we could accommodate her being late. What happened was she was late. She ended up having a shorter interview. And unfortunately, you know, there wasn't any extra slack time and she didn't end up getting the position. 
Um, another thing too, depending on the, the campus that you're at, it's one of the great opportunities within interviewing is we're often given questions about 15 minutes before the interview so you can review them. Um, if you get that opportunity and you are given your interview questions, just know chances are it's gonna be about 10 questions. It's not that many. You're going to have only a few minutes for each. And so one of my rules of thumb is for each question, I put three to five bullets of what I plan to say when I'm in the interview. That way I know I'm only gonna talk for a few minutes. I'm gonna try and keep it short, but I'm gonna hit those main points. If you get the chance to get your interview questions before your interview and you start writing a narrative, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen it where somebody goes, oh, I've got 15 minutes and they might have their questions. It might even be a two pager of questions or maybe you have to flip the page over and you see somebody frantically, frantically taking so many notes at the beginning that they run out of time and have no notes for their later questions. And then they go into the interview and they do well on the first part of the interview and they get to the second part and they pause and they freeze and it's uncomfortable and they have no notes to work with at that point. And so then they start repeating and they tell you, you know, if I've only got 30 minutes with somebody, you don't have to tell me the same thing four times. You know, I don't want that. In each question, I want you to be really specific about how you're addressing each question. So. Remember now, um, you want to, when you're, if you get the chance to review those questions, you want to make sure you put three to five bullets per question um, for your responses. You want to make sure that you have a chance to look over the entire page or pages of questions to make sure you're not being repetitive. You want to make sure also that within those three to five bullets per question, that you're also like dribbling in something about the department, something about the school, something about your nonprofit experience, something about your community service, something about volunteering. So you wanna weave all those pieces in. Colleges are not only looking for somebody to teach classes, they want faculty who are gonna represent them in the community throughout all that they do. So it's really important to let them know how you are a great match for the position by showcasing not just your academic skill set, but also um, your connections in the community and, and the other work that you do. Um, let's see. Another thing, too, that's really important, as you're embedding your three to five bullets within those notes, you want to make sure that you are trying to um, talk about something that's important to you, but that you also know is important about, um, about the campus. So, for instance, they might ask you a question about equity right? Because equity is something we're all talking about right now. So you can then respond and say, I have a strong commitment to equity and was thrilled that your, apartment or that your department holds an annual equity conference. I've been speaking about equity in the classroom for 18 years now, and I look forward about to the possibility of joining your department and helping to be part of this annual equity conference. So right there, you let them know that you know the department, you know an annual event that happens, you've got the skill set and the background needed for it, and you want to help. So it's kind of like you embed all these things and you kind of package them in a way um, that you want them to hire you. Don't feel weird about bragging. Oh my gosh, this is the thing that drives, one of the things that drives me crazy. Two things, first off, people come into interviews and they assume that we know you. We don't. The reality is I might have reviewed, or there's maybe two or three of us reviewed your paperwork two weeks ago. It's probably sitting in a folder right there that HR gave me as I walk into the interview and you walk into the interview. So please think that way from the beginning that there are going to be, that the people on your interview staff need to be reminded of who you are. Your paperwork, your resume and your application, your cover letter got you through first round. They got you, they got you um, in a spot where we're excited to meet you. So now you have to remind us who you are. You have to sell yourself. You have to make sure that you are memorable. It is possible that we could have eight interviews back to back in one day. And so what are you going to do that's going to make you stand out? Don't feel like you're bragging. Don't feel like you're, you know, selling. Well, you are selling yourself. That's just what you have to do. It's part of the process. Another thing when it comes to um, your interview, this is something I'm, I'm specific about for some reason, but you wanna be dressed in a way that's memorable. 
there's a reason why I'm wearing a little bit of polka dot and color today. I love this shirt. I like to wear this shirt in general because it's not just a plain black shirt or, oh my gosh, I can't even tell you when somebody walks in and they're wearing a full beige outfit head to toe. And I think, wow, you want to be memorable today? You're walking it. You're like, you're like camouflage with the wall, you know, and not that you want to come in wearing Hawaiian prints or neon 80s colors or anything crazy like that. But, you know, a little bit of polka dot, a little bit of color, a little bit of something that's going to make you memorable. I will be honest with you, um, in addition to doing interviewing uh, for, for jobs, I also do interviews for scholarships in my community um, of high school seniors. And I have this one high school senior who wore a polka dot dress to her interview. She wore a polka dot dress to her second interview. And I said to her, I'm like, I've got to tell you, by you wearing a polka dot dress, the first thing I think of is I see your name and I think, oh, she's the polka dot person. And it instantly makes me smile. And so I told her that early on. I said, I know this might sound strange, but I think that what you're wearing or have chosen to wear has really made you stand out. I remember you now. And so it's great because now she's, she's actually finished her bachelor's degree and she's working on her credential and master's program and she still wears her polka dots. She knows that she needs to show up and she's got a great personality. Why not have an outfit that's going to help to kind of share that? Um, I also want to talk about something that right now is really tricky for all of us. I know that we are in the middle of a pandemic and we are in the middle of social distancing and mask wearing and trying to figure out what school's gonna look like come uh, fall. Fortunately for our community colleges, um, we have many that have already made plans, um, but, but it's, things are looking different right now. So I'm gonna talk about something that is truly for a traditional interview. Um, so you might experience this, you might not, just depending on when you go to interview. Um, the first couple minutes in your interview is so essential because within those first few moments of meeting you, we're really looking at your transferable skills or your employability skills. We're not looking at your content at any point. When you come in the room and I'm interviewing you, I wanna know, um, is the person gonna shake my hand? Are they gonna look me in the eye as they're introducing themselves to me? Um, what or will we have any physical contact at all? How is it that we, how am I going to be connected to that person? And that might sound really, really simple, but I've also been in, in interviews before where they were debating about two people and somebody gave a handshake at the end of the interview. And based on that person having better employability skills, that person was the one that got the, got, ended up getting the position. So you never know what little thing can be the difference between you getting a position or not. So you want to make sure you've got eye contact. You want to make sure that if you have an opportunity to shake hands, do it. If you don't have an opportunity to shake hands, but you can walk by and say, you know, touch a shoulder and say, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to interview today. I look forward to hearing back from you guys. You know, anything like that makes a huge difference. Now, for those of you that are going to be interviewing soon, um, and most likely interviewing online. Um, you're not gonna be able to shake hands or make any physical contacts, you know what I mean? And so what you're gonna have to then work on is your facial expressions during interviews. If you are going to be um, interviewing online for a position, you're going to need to be able to get that personable side of who you are out um, very quickly without being able to connect and touch and things like that. So um, it's kind of, it can be kind of tricky, but it's really important that you want people to feel comfortable. You want them to feel um, you know, like you're going to be the right match, that you're the person for the job. And part of that are those employability skills or those soft skills or those personable skills. Um, one thing to know also when it comes time to your interview, you are going to be asked hardly any questions. I mean, you're looking at probably 10 to 12 questions total maybe two to three minutes per question. Here's the point that I need to make about that. Don't be long-winded. You need to hit your points and hit your points fast. Because in an interview, we have a limited amount of time that we're allowed to be with you. So if you have somebody who's more long-winded and they only get to eight of the 10 questions, that's a problem because we have to score for every single question. So even if you answered eight great and then you didn't get to nine and 10 at all, you're gonna be docked off for not having nine and 10 answered. So um, it's, it's kind of tricky. You wanna make sure that you hit your points clearly, clearly, you hit your points concisely. We're not gonna make you feel like you don't have any time, um, but it's a fast process. It's a, and also another thing too, 
it can be intimidating. And um, uh, one of my words of advice, and this is a tricky one, especially right now with everything going on with COVID, but one of the best times to interview for a position is when you're not desperate, when you already have another position that you like, that you're making decent money at. So then you go in for the, when you decide then, okay, I'm gonna try for something else. When somebody comes into an interview and they're at a place of being open and willing and trying something new versus a place of desperation, it comes across totally differently, totally different. Um, so it's really, if you have a chance to interview while you're in a secure position, that's a healthy thing to do. Um, not everybody likes to do that um, because interviewing, as I said, can be intimidating. But the truth is, the more you interview, the better that you get at it. Um, the more you practice, the better you get. Now, going back to the interview questions, earlier I had mentioned the, the need to have it, your responses tied into the vision statement, the mission statement, you know, campus information, and your department. Those are the kind of notes you want to be jotting down before you walk into the interview. Um, there's going to be very specific things that they will ask you on those interview questions. If you can refer to the department website, if you can refer to the classes that are going to be offered, or what type of certificates or degrees are available, um, things like that, it'd be really helpful for those of you going out for an adjunct part-time position. Um, you don't have to know everything, but if you can at least know the course descriptions from the cat uh, from the school catalog um, or at least have some context with them that will help you significantly during your interview for those of you going out for a full-time position um, you really want to get course outlines and course outlines are available online they are public access for each campus so you can have access to that curriculum and it's way more strategic because the course outlines will tell you really like the deep dive of the information that that department's teaching. Um, so it's really, it's a good thing to do. Excuse me a second, I'm gonna take a quick drink. Another piece for interviewing that's really important, when you're interviewing, if at any point you're stumped or you're not sure how to answer, it's really important to have a couple strategies. First off, if they ask you a question and you're not sure of it, you can restate it. If I understand correctly, you're asking me blah, 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 blah. You know, and then they might say, oh, no, we actually meant this. Or they'll say, oh, yeah, that's exactly what we're asking. Here's the thing. When you say, when you do like a check for understanding, not only are you checking to make sure that that's what they're asking you, but you're giving your brain a little bit of think time to come up with a response. And so um, you don't want to do that every single question. Like you don't want to say, you know, if you get 10 questions, you don't want to say number one through 10. If I understand you correctly, this is what I think you're asking. But in that kind of a situation, maybe you get 10 questions, you can probably do that twice without a problem at all. Um, another thing you can do too is you can just ask, can you give me a few moments of think time before I respond to you? I'd like to think about my response before I get back to you. Um, that, it sounds strange, but people really appreciate that. Um, when you get into the interview, you're only given really a few minutes to like kind of, um, prove why you would be a, a good full-time faculty member or a good part-time faculty member. Um, full-time interviews are a little bit longer, there's multiple rounds, but it's really not, um, we don't, you don't really get the amount of time really needed, honestly, from both sides of us within the interview. So it's imperative that you get to the point as soon as possible and you let us know why you are the match for the position. Um, when you do it too, though, when you're getting to the point, don't be robotic. You got to be really personable. They're looking for faculty who can reach students. Student-centered is a huge thing. Um, we are student-focused, and we want to make sure that the people who are teaching our students know how to connect them. Um, it's really, really important. Another thing too, don't undervalue yourself within an interview. If you have had the opportunity to be in, the, in, in an industry, um, if you've had an opportunity to hold a position in education before, if you've even volunteered in the field of education, it's important to share that with everybody who's on your interview panel. Um, for instance, if you're somebody who's coming from industry and you want to go into the classroom, right now there's so many career tech, technical, uh, excuse me, career technical education faculty positions that are open. We are looking for people who've been in the industry, so or who've served in industry. Now, for those who've either held a position in education or volunteered in the field of education, you want to make sure you share that too. And here's why: um, it goes far when you say something like. 
I am the PTA president of my student, my child's school, or I have, um, I'm, a, I'm a Girl Scout leader, or I was an Eagle Scout and I got a gold, um, the gold award or whatever. Um, you know what I mean? It's really, sorry, I think I just blurred um, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts there. I apologize for those of you that are Scout people, but it's important that you share those things. Some of those points that you might think are not relevant are so relevant. I learned early on that if I mentioned the one year I was a brownie and part of the Girl Scouts when I was a child, that for some people it made a difference. Um, and so you try and tie in those pieces of who you are. Now, here's the truth. You give it 100%, but you're authentic to who you are. It's not like you're making stuff up, you know, but um, just be authentic to who you are and make sure you share it. Another thing I want to share with you has to do the topics of the questions. Honestly, you could probably Google you could probably Google and get a good idea of what some of the questions would be. But there are certain things that are asked all the time. Um, how do you promote diversity and equity in the classroom? How are you sensitive to having a diverse population on campus? How are you sensitive to working with um, you know, students who are all ages, um, all ethnicities, all, all, um, all languages? We wanna know what do you bring to the table? Why should we hire you? So when you have those, I mean, so there's certain questions that are going to be pretty standard. We want to know about special populations. We want to know your take on equity. Right now, they'll probably be asking you about distance learning and what that means. Um, you want to make sure that you are on top of whatever's going on in your field, too. For instance, and I'm speaking from early childhood and education. Right now in my field, one of the things that we're most concerned about is what does field work and practicum look like for fall? So if I was interviewing people for a position right now, I would hope that they would say, you know, I've got this concern and I'm wondering what your school's gonna do about it. Because if they're coming in saying that they have the same concern that we have, oh, it's a, it's a proof that it, the person's a match, you know? I think it's really important. Um, I'm gonna get in the teaching demo for just a few minutes. Before I get to that though, one essential piece that I feel a lot of people a lot of people lose, um, just lose out on. At the end of every interview, you are always asked if you have any, inter any questions for the interview committee. And I have to tell you, um, like 95%, no, maybe not 95, but probably at least 80% of the time, the only question we are asked is, when are you going to fill this position? Or when will this position be decided? And people just wanna know the date. Um, there's nothing wrong with asking that, but, I way prefer when somebody asks something specialized, <laughs> um, like right now, I, if I was interviewing and somebody said, and I said, you know, do you have any interview or do you have any questions for the committee? And they said, you know, I'm curious, what is your, co what is your campus response to COVID-19 and distance learning? How are you going to meet students' needs? Oh my gosh, that would stump us and it would be great. Because if somebody's thinking that deeply before coming to the campus and think about the depth of their thinking and, and being once they're on the campus. Right now, if you're not sure what kind of questions to ask and you're like going through the process or will be going through the process, um, I have a couple things that are top of my mind. COVID-19, number one, distance learning, equity, our homeless students, I mean, we, strong workforce, you could talk about workforce development, you know, anything like that that are, that are important to the community college system, you wanna tap into that. Um, especially when they, we get to that point where we say, do you have any questions for us at the end? Um, that's a great thing to do. If you're not sure what other topics that you could ask within those two questions, I highly suggest you go to the California Community College Chancellor's Office website, which I think is like CCCCO, it's either, I think maybe .edu, I, hopefully I'm not saying it wrong there, but just look for California Community College Chancellor's Office, and their website gets into all sorts of different topics that are imperative right now within our system that we are looking at. So we'll give you a very good glimpse of some of the um, types of topics you may wanna ask questions about. Um, teaching demonstrations. I almost wanna be like, raise your hand if you've done a teaching demo, because I've done them a few times and it's, it's nerve wracking for sure. How do you showcase everything that you bring to the classroom in a 10 to 15 minute window? <laughs> um, it's really, really challenging. First of all, uh, one of the things that I've seen over time that, is, that can be negative, make sure you understand your teaching demonstration topic. 
If you have any questions, um, please contact Human Resources um, the moment you get the topic, so that way if they need to clarify with the department chair, they have time to do that. That might not happen like the day of. So it's really important that for your teaching demo, if you have any questions or disequilibrium about what's being expected to you, that you contact ahead of time to get the clarification. Okay, teaching demo. Like I said, 10 to 15 minutes. First of all, can't be too complicated. You need to be able to get into your subject area as fast as possible. We are going to want to see how you will engage your students, which basically is your interview panel. And that can be tricky. Sometimes within a teaching demo, it feels weird to try and engage the people that are rating you and whatnot, but you just have to pretend like we are your regular students. And if you don't engage us, um, that would be a huge, huge warning to anybody on the panel. Um, another thing too, if you decide to show any slides or videos, keep it to a minimum. There is nothing like somebody having 15 minutes for a teaching demo and they show a four minute video to intro it and then they're down to 11 minutes to showcase what they know. Um, there's nothing wrong with showing something supplemental, but like if I had 15 minutes, I wouldn't take any more than one to two minutes for a video or something like that to showcase that piece of it. If I was gonna do slides in a 15 minute um, window, you're maybe looking at three slides, maybe four max. You have to keep it to a minimum. We want to see you. We want to see how do you manage people? How do you manage curriculum? Are you going to be hands on? What are you going to do to engage us? We are looking at student engagement and how do we keep students interested in what they're studying. So it's really important that we want to see you. We want to see how you're going to do that. Many, many times, people get up and just deliver their curriculum. And they'll sit there with their PowerPoint or their Prezi and they're clicking and they're clicking. There's nothing like an, an interview that's really short and somebody's got 20 slides. It's not good for any of us. Um, so, because then you feel like that person's hiding behind this PowerPoint. And who wants to sit, I mean, don't we know now in education, none of us want to sit and listen to an 80 slide PowerPoint for an hour. That's not effective. Engagement is what we're looking for, um, real engagement. Okay, so those are just a few tips in terms of your, your um, demo, your teaching demo. One real important thing that I think is um, something that a lot of people miss out on an opportunity Whenever you're done with your interview, uh, it's great to find, um, usually you can find out pretty easily um, when the job is closing or when the interviews are done. A lot of times I don't ask my interview committee, but I might ask human resources ahead of time because that's the information, kind of information that they will um, often let you know. Um, oh, we've got another day of interviews coming up on Friday and it's Wednesday. So right there, if you're interviewing on Wednesday and you know that they're also interviewing on Friday, the first thing I would do is the moment I'm done with that interview, I would put a card and I would drop it on that into the person's box, like right then. I'd put them in the car, maybe even have them written out, I'd put the people's names on them, stop at the campus switchboard or wherever they have their mail room, get those cards in as soon as possible, or drop it in the mail if you know you have more time. Now, if you are the last day of interviews, there isn't time for that, but you still want to make some sort of follow-up communication. So in that kind of a situation, if you're the last day of interviews, the moment you step out of the interview, you find a place where that you have good Wi-Fi, you sit down and you craft a nice email and you get it sent out right away. Um, it's imperative to touch base with people after the interview process to express thanks for the opportunity. Um, people want to work with others who are pleasant. They want to work with people who have good manners and who are easy to work with and are generally nice. And it sounds really silly, but when you um, you'd be shocked how many people or how people come across in interviews at times. And so when you're bringing that best foot forward, following up and being able to say, hey, thanks so much for the chance, even if you don't get it, is a great thing to do. It's important to know that many, many people struggle with interviewing. Um, it is probably one of the hardest things that I've had some of my colleagues really, really struggle with. And one of the things that is, is hurtful to me is when somebody struggles with interviewing and they're a fantastic professor. And so you see that sometimes they might not get the opportunities because of that, that interviewing gatekeeping that's not allowing them to move forward. Practice. I know it might sound silly, but practice, practice, practice. You want to be talking to somebody the night before your interview and having them grill you on the questions. You want to be looking up potential questions online and, and saying them to yourself. You want to have your friend ask you, whoever you feel comfortable with, your husband, your wife, um, have people who can both 
informally and formally do some practice with you. Another thing that I do too, and, and not everybody um, agrees with this, but I'm going to be really honest for you with, with you guys about this. It's important at some points of your career to interview when you, when you might not necessarily really take the position. Um, and not that you want to waste people's time, but if there's something that interests you and you think it might be a match, but you're really not 100% sure about the move or, or whatever, what other variables, that's okay. That's a great time to take a chance and see if it's the right match for you. That's the great time to practice a formal interview. There's nothing wrong with going through an interviewing process and not getting it. The process itself is incredibly helpful, um, especially if you know of another position that's coming six months from now that you do desperately want. Um, that's a great thing to do. When you're not desperate for a position, as I mentioned earlier, your outlook of the process is totally different and you come across totally differently. Okay, another quick last tip um, before we open up for questions. Um, and this, this is one that's kind of cheesy, but this is something that I've done. Um, I actually didn't do this for interviewing. Uh, a couple years ago, um, I had the opportunity to go up to some, um, some uh, budget subcommittee meetings in Sacramento and advocate for the Strong Workforce Program. You know, the one that got cut by 50% this week. Um, but before it was even in our system, we had some of us that had a chance to go up to Sacramento and speak in front of politicians directly about the importance of what the funds would do. And um, that was nerve wracking because um, even though I, I've served community colleges for many years, in my own identity, I, I kind of identify as what I was in K-12. I was a kindergarten teacher when I started out on this pathway. Actually, I started in preschool and then went to kindergarten. And so for me, I was like, ooh, a kindergarten, you know, kindergarten teacher speaking to senators, like how am I gonna do that? And so I just put myself in the mind game. First of all, I reminded myself who I was at that moment versus who I've been in the past, because um, it had been many, many years since I had been a kindergarten teacher, even though that identity stayed with me. The other thing that I did and that I often suggest people do is I found a theme song. And um, it's basically like my theme song. So whenever I'm going into something that's uncomfortable or that I, that I feel like I'm like, um, like not the right person for it, or maybe, you know, I'm just not feeling 100% for some reason, I play my theme song. And it gets me all psyched up. I play it in the car. I'll sing it as I'm walking in. It's super cheesy, but for me, it works. For me, um, my theme song when I was going up and speaking um, at those Senate committees, was Big Time by Peter Gabriel, because the whole concept of, or at least my perception of the song is, he, you know, I'm on my way, I'm making it, I'm gonna fake it until I make it. And I, there I was standing there in front of, you know, this huge group of people that were making these, like millions and millions and millions of dollars of investment um, um, decisions. And I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna play my song and be who I am and try the best I can be. And the great thing about having a theme song is you come in with your chest like puffed up and you're like ready to go. And that's what a theme song should be about. So as long as it's, I know it's kind of cheesy, but it is a little tip that can help. Please know that colleges are always looking for faculty that are adaptable. They want people that are flexible, especially right now with everything that's going on. We need faculty, both part-time and full-time, that are student-centered and that they have something to contribute, not only to the department, but to the school and also to our community. So it's, you just gotta walk into the interview confidently and basically you want to give them everything you've got. And it can be exhausting, but it should also be kind of fun. And it would be smart if you can kind of put that in perspective where I'm just gonna go in there and give it my best and see what happens. And you might be very pleasantly surprised and end up with a part-time or full-time position after, you know, just shortly after. So, okay, let me see. I'm gonna look right now and see if we have any questions in the chat. And then I'll open it up and people can take their mics off. And if anybody wants, or excuse me, they can unmute. And if anybody has any questions that they'd like to talk about, I am happy to. Okay, we have somebody that asked if, I could, if we can send the document that I'm speaking from. I'm happy to do that. If so, just put your email in the chat. And then what we will do is, um, Bobby, do you mind copying the chat so we have it for later? And then I can follow up with people. Okay, great. Uh, Heather, would you, you, you said, can you please share a few effective ways to show engagement through your demonstration. Can you share just a little bit what type of engagement you mean? 
Hi, thank you. So you said that you really, when you're um, in the interview or when you have the demonstration, you really want to be engaging. And so I'm wondering like what, if that could be different things for different people. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what you have felt from um, um, being on the other side, what has been most effective in demonstrating engagement? Engagement can be as simple, Heather, as asking a question. You know what I mean? Like, I think about when you're in front of a classroom and you want to teach people, you know, do you want to have the model where you just disseminate the information? No, we, it should be like a dialogue going back and forth. So, and you can't really do that within a 15 minute interview, but you can say, um, okay, uh, maybe you start off with a pair share because you want to get them engaged with each other. Maybe you've got four people on your panel. So you say, okay, here's the topic. I'd like you to talk about um, ways to promote equity in the classroom. Share with the person next to you, and then I'm going to ask you to share in front of the whole group. Because you might do that in a classroom. You want to make sure that they can contribute something, even if it's just one sentence during that interview process, because then those people will be engaged. So you treat them like a student. You ask a question, you ask them to share an opinion, something like that, and it'll get them going. I have a question, Renee. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for this workshop, Renee. This is awesome. But Excellent. when, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, when, when we're talking about like, um, and I think somebody asked it in the chat about bringing, like when we do a teaching demo, do we like, should we bring props? Let's say for example. Great question. Um, yeah. It depends on what department. If you're coming to early childhood education and yes. you show up with props, I'm going to be worried. I'm not going to lie. Um, if you are coming into a different field, they might not want any sort of props. If something is relevant to your industry, mm -hmm. you bring it in. In education right, right. and early childhood ed, if you're not hands-on with those students and modeling that from the start with faculty, ugh, I wouldn't, that'd be a big warning sign that I wouldn't want to hire you. But now if you were coming in and doing a physics lesson, I don't know if you would bring in something there do you know what i'm saying right, 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 so it right. just matters like you have to know kind of the culture of the where you're applying the department you're applying so yeah and, and i think it, the question i'm at the reason why i'm asking is i remember for my when i got interviewed as an adjunct mm -hmm. and i was asked to demonstrate uh how i would teach science in for the science curriculum course and i remember you know because i didn't um I didn't think about it and I wish right there in the interview like man I wish I could have brought like my props that I use you know when you I used to teach uh, preschool and I thought about it in the moment I still got hired but I was thinking right now that somebody asked a question that's such a great question yeah. you should bring I think for my field I'm in early childhood education you do use a lot of props in your classroom mm -hmm. and I when I when I interviewed for early childhood education I absolutely brought props in and when I had okay. people interview for me um they would bring different props if they were edu uh, like education they wouldn't tend to bring as many props um but they often have other grabbers to get people's attention like starting off with a song or something else that would grab attention but for early childhood um only a few people didn't bring props for a teaching demo i had okay. one person who their prop was a long powerpoint I was, and I yeah. was like, oh my gosh, if you're teaching a three hour class <laughs> and you're in the 15 minutes I'm bored, what oh, is no. the class going to be, I, you know, I, and not yeah. it's a dog and pony show, but just some engagement, you know, some personality. Um, oh, I love this. Amy just yeah, said, yeah, please answer here. that one. I yeah, would it be weird to have your interviewers practice in a brief group activity during your teaching demo? Not at all. I, it, it engages people so much. And even if you can just get them to answer one question or work in a group or pair share or any of those strategies, um, it will help. Also, for those of you who are on the call, please keep my cell phone number and my email. As you're interviewing for positions, if you ever want to like talk to somebody ahead of time or practice with somebody, I'm here to help. One of the things that I love to do is when I, honestly, when I help, there's nothing like helping a colleague practice for an interview and then calling you two days later and saying, I'm a full-time faculty member now. So it's, I mean, any, if, if any of you ever want to do that, um, please, please know that I am somebody who you can do that with. I'd be happy to. Sharon, I also see that you mentioned you got your California credential 25 years ago and you believe it hurts your interview chances. Um, is your credential K-12? Sorry, I'm looking to see if she's answering. Yes, okay. Um, 
I don't think it will hurt your chances at all. It will only help your chances, honestly, um, because it's like I, I was a little worried coming from the K-12 system because I have a credential and then I also have a credential, uh, administrative credential K-12. And I thought, oh my gosh, will I be seen as legitimate in the community college system? I was not only seen as legitimate when I got hired from the community college system, since my position was relevant to the work I had done in K-12, Sharon, they actually gave me 10 years credit for the work that I had done and put me on the salary scale 10 years in, um, even though it was my first year as a full-time faculty member. So I would not take it off. I, would, I wouldn't like highlight it though, if it's been 25 years, but I, it's part of, part of what you've done and part of your training that has brought you to this exact moment. So it's part of your story. And if anybody sees it as a deficit, that's, that's not the kind of group you wanna be working with. They should see it as an asset and figure out how can we take her past industry experience, even though it was in education, and have it be related to my education system or her new education system. Um, I agree with Julio, she would bring a, big, bring a great deal of experience with 25 years. If you've got a credential for 25 years, oh my gosh, I almost have a credential for 25, I'm 24, I think. <laughs> I mean, but it's something that you should still um, be proud about. I see a question here too from Heather. What's the best way to find good fit open positions? Oh, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that is helpful is to find insiders. So for instance, say you live in Pasadena and you're curious what their um, you know, biology department is like. I would find somebody else who's on that campus and talk to them and see what you can find out, see if you can find a connection. Um, and you could always cold call and see what kind of information you could get that way too. You know? But I think it's better when you can say, um, you know, like there's, uh, you know what, I'll give an example. Ventura College is one of my favorite colleges. And um, it's become one of my favorite colleges because of the people that I've met from there and what they've told me about the college. And so uh, I know that I would want to interview with Ventura if there was an opportunity, just based on what I've heard over the years. And so it's really important if any campus is of interest to you, that you can find an insider you can talk to, to learn more about that department or that campus to see if it would be a good fit for you. That insider doesn't necessarily need to be in the same department though. Um, if, and, and people will be, sometimes it's helpful if somebody's out of the department. You might have somebody who's in automotive and you're looking for a welding um, position and they might say, you know what, the welding department on our campus is toxic. You don't want to work there. Or, you know, they might give you a, an, an, a look or a view of it that, that somebody in the department might not have. So um, another thing too, if you go in for an interview and it feels not right, it's probably not right. Believe your gut. Um, I will, this is going to sound kind of like hippie, but there's been times where I've read applications or, or like I read a job description where I literally was like, oh, I have to go out for that. Like I felt like I had to go out for it. Um, so, you know, kind of in terms of an open fit, it has to be a combination of what your gut is telling you as you're researching, but also trying to find insiders. Um, one thing we can also share. Um, I'm part of the California Community College Teacher Preparation Programs, and we have um, colleagues on many of the 115 campuses. So if you need help connecting to a campus, um, I'm pretty sure that if you contact me and Bobby Yadira, you know, anybody who put this together, that um, we can help find a person that can meet with you and talk with you, for sure. Renee, I also, can I just say, yeah. uh, just add to that, and I think it's so important that you say that, there's been instances where I've gone to interview and I kid you not that I am sitting there and I can feel it in my gut like that position, that like I was, that's not meant for me, that yeah. position. Like you can feel it too if it's for somebody else, but they just needed you for the numbers. It's sad, totally. but that's the truth. Totally. One of the reasons why I got the full-time position I had is because um, I was so confident in my interview. They literally said to me, God, you were so confident. It was almost intimidating. And I said, well, I have another great position on campus, so I have nothing to lose. And I felt like this was supposed to be the right position for me. So of course, I'm going to come into it confidently. And so, and of course, then at that point, my, my president looked at me and she goes, are you going to come and take my job? <laughs> Is that your plan to come and take my job eventually? Wow. And I looked at her and I said, I respect you so much and you've been leading our campus for over 30 years now. When the time comes that you retired, I hope I would be a candidate to take over for you. And she was like, oh, I guess I need to think that way. And I'm like, yeah. So you just go in and you be yourself and you be confident and you know, you don't try to fit your 
square into a whole position. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you want to look for something that feels right. And the more that you can meet the people. Oh, another thing too. If any positions that you're going for, if they're having any events on campus from that department or from that whatever, you know, other, however related, that would be another good opportunity to go and kind of get a feel of just what it feels like. Um, if it feels like the group of people you want to go with, are they going to offer any professional development? Like see what you can find out that they have going on and tag into it before you, you know, jump in to actually interview with them. See if those are the right people that you want to be, if it's the right culture you want to be in. Oh, great. I see Heather, too, has a great um, question here. Oh, also, I'm going to jump back real quick. Sharon said she has a master's. Sharon, I proudly, proudly, proudly share my K-12 master's degrees. Um, I have two. And so don't ever, don't ever feel like that'll be against us. Um, okay, a quick, quick question here. Are interview questions always provided in advance? Now, I haven't worked at all 115 campuses, but the ones that I've interviewed for have always given me questions ahead of time by about a 10 to 15 minute window. Um, so I do not know if that's a campus by campus negotiated or how that works. Um, but um, another thing too, if you know people on campus and you can't get interview questions ahead of time, one thing you might want to say is, hey, can you give me some topics that you think might be on the interview? Because chances are um, the questions are pretty broad, honestly. Um, they really, really are. It's not like they're going to ask like super crazy specific curriculum questions. They're really made like we create a set of questions that really goes for us hiring anybody in the department, not necessarily one specialist position. Um, great. Any other questions here? Looking through the chat to see if I missed anything. I don't think you missed anything. Okay, is there anybody else on the line who has any questions? I'm just gonna wait a second, just in case anybody's muting. It's great to see how many people showed up. Right, so I was much. gonna say that, Renee. I was gonna say, wow, I'm so glad to see a lot of people here. We, I wanna make a shout out to Shanti. Shanti, if you're still here, I just wanna say hi to you. Shanti is, a fact, adjunct faculty just like me uh, that works at both Rio Hondo at El Camino College. Excellent, excellent. When you go out for a full time or call me, I will happily work with you to like, you know, get you ready for any full time interviews. Shanti, she's awesome. awesome. Uh, uh, Julio, Julio, okay, we just, got a, just, great just question. got a question. <laughs> uh, Julio just said, will there be budget problems which would minimize hiring during the pandemic? Yes. Our budget was slashed. Um, yep. Right now at this last week, with what came out with Newsom was just scary, honestly, for all of our education systems. For the community college system, we are praying that the HEROES Act goes through. That's going to help. Um, but honestly, um, we are in trouble. So there should be minimal hiring, especially in the next few months. I expect it to pick up once things from COVID kind of, you know, end, hopefully, or kind of normalize. Uh, but things will be a little bit, little bit iffy dicey right now you might have to go for um more part-time positions versus full-time positions right now um, as campuses are having people leave as long as they have the minimum number of full-time positions that they're required to have they will be more likely to hire um, um, adjunct until the budget kind of balances out a bit um, it costs a campus like just to put it in perspective for an adjunct faculty member to teach a class it's about thirty five hundred dollars but you've got a faculty member, they might make like, you know, $90,000 a year and they teach 10 classes a year. So, um, and then when you add all your benefits and everything, it just, it becomes a lot more expensive. But if you can even get in as part-time and then eventually move into a full-time position, that's a great thing. Um, oh, I see a good one here. How do you handle a question that is asked um, to which you have no experience? I'd be honest. I'd say, you know, I don't have any direct experience in this area, but if I was given this, here's what I think I would do. And in that kind of a situation, I'd probably say, first thing I'd wanna do is talk to one of my colleagues in the department to see what the norm of the and the culture of the department is before moving forward, you know? But it's okay to say that you don't know everything. Um, it totally is. Um, and, and that's, and people understand that. And you would say, and if they, you know, if they ask you something, you could say, you know what, I don't know the answer, but after class, I'll go ahead and Google it and find out and make sure that I, um, uh, What's the word? Like, make sure I follow up with you next class, especially like if you're in your teaching demo and something like that happens, that'd be a great opportunity. Um, okay. If they say, sorry, say if you. If they say you have nothing to lose, then why are you here? What do you say? 
I'm here, I'm here to make a bigger contribution to our campus. I absolutely love being, I'm just gonna say what I said. I absolutely love being an adjunct faculty <laughs> member in both the education and early childhood departments and running teacher preparation on campus. But if I'm given the opportunity to be a full-time faculty member, I can't even imagine how much I'm gonna be able to contribute. I'm just excited about the possibility. If it doesn't work out, I'm still here as your adjunct faculty member. But if it does work out and I end up being the best choice, I can't even wait to see what I'm able to do when I'm full time and I'm here all the time. So there's another question. What types of classified positions would you recommend that would act as a foot in the door on a campus? Great question. You know, I think this one's kind of tricky too. Personally, I would try to do contract work with campuses see if you could come on and be a guest speaker or something you know like come and do a workshop present at a conference something to that um, to start a lot of times people will come on campus and they will look for positions that are like um, short time um, uh, short time positions on campus where I was at they call them adult hourly positions um, but basically it's like um, you know it's you're not permanent and whatnot but the thing with those positions that I've seen, sometimes people get those positions on campus and then they end up staying in them for so long. And so instead of it becoming a foot in the door, it becomes almost like, like quicksand where you're like stuck in it and you can't move. So I would be really cautious about what you're willing to take on campus. Um, I pers to me personally, the first step would be to, to do some sort of consulting and do some, show them what you've got and then to try to come in as an adjunct faculty member and then move into a full-time faculty member. You could also look for other positions on campus. You don't have to serve as faculty. You can serve as a director, you can serve as a coordinator. There, there are a lot of opportunities. The only thing I would say is I just don't undersell yourself. You know, don't go out for a position that's gonna be $16 an hour if you've got a doctorate. You know, you don't want something that's not, you don't want anything that's desperate and that's too big of a mismatch because then they're gonna see you as that position and not understand your potential. Um, and you don't wanna kind of get locked in for that. Okay. Okay, Julio also said, um, Bobby, if I'm skipping any, let me know too. Um, Julio also said, um, we should have paperwork ready just in case, applications, other pro appropriate documents, correct? Absolutely. Always have your transcripts, always have sealed transcripts that you've purchased and you just have a ton of them. Especially if you're done with all your schooling and nothing is in process, just have them. Um, and that's something that's really important. Letters of recommendation, an essential piece of letters of recommendation, a lot of times they'll say as long as they're dated within a year, within letters of recommendation, if something's a year ago, as, a, as somebody who's reviewing paperwork, I have a problem with that. If it's been a year since that person has written that letter of recommendation and I have 60 other applicants that have their letters of rec that are recent, you know, it's like you just always think about you're going to be in a large group. So what's going to make you st stand out? Letters of recommendation, have people write them for you now. And then so then they have them in their computer. So whenever you're going up for a new job, they can you can say, hey, I'm going up for this position. This is what it entails. Would you mind updating my letter? And then they're going to update the letter. They'll send it to you with a new date, maybe even include the specific college and specific position you're applying for. And then it shows that you are, your level of detail, you're making sure even your letters of rec are also aligning to what you're doing. So it's, it's tricky. You want to have everything ready, but you want to have everything ready to update on the spot because you want it to be current um, as close as possible to the, the interview um, and the time that you're going to be interviewed. Great. I don't see any others. I've been scrolling up and down. I don't think you missed anything. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. I hope it was useful to you. Um, that's all I'm ever trying to be in this world is useful to people. So I hope this webinar was useful to you. Um, I also hope that you consider attending additional um, training that we have available right now for free. Um, if you, for some reason, only got this link to this webinar and you don't know that we have a whole, we have a whole series of different things going on right now, um, please reach out to me or Bobby Becca or Yadira, and we will make sure that we send you the list of everything going on. Um, and also, this is kind of random, but for anybody who is a parent who's struggling with kids right now um, and homeschooling, I'm also doing a workshop on Friday on um, positive discipline and behavior management with young children. 
and uh, and it'd be happy. I'd be happy for you to join us. So thank you so much, everybody. I, oh, awesome, Heather. <laughs> You're not alone. I'm a mama twin, so I'm with you guys. So, anyways, uh, great talking with everybody. Thank you so much. Please be in contact. And please feel free to call me or email or text at any time. If you are going for an interview, I would love to be the person to help you on the phone and to be grilling you and getting you ready to go. So thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Take care, everybody. I also put the link to the program in the chat box. Beautiful. And just so everybody That's knows, that link that Bobby included, that has all sorts of... Um, workshops that are for free for everybody so it's a great one to go to if you have any i want to say if you guys have any students if those of you who are teaching uh we have a workshop on tuesday that's put together by uh, students from yohando and el camino college and it's called home um home and school life during quarantine time um the, it, the workshop should be there on the link and it's also on tuesday well thank you so much everybody i really appreciate it Okay, I'm officially going to stop our recording and start logging out. Everybody have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Renee. Bye, it's Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much.